We'll get going. We have uh, two more speakers left uh, before our panel discussion, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, one of our own, um, Dr. Paul Mitchell is a professor of agricultural and applied economics uh, here at uh, UW-Madison, uh, also an, ex an Extension State Specialist and Director of the Rank Agribusiness Institute and co-director of the Nutrient and Pest Management Program at UW-Extension. His research and outreach focus broadly on um, the economics of crop management, pest economics, and practical approaches to agricultural sustainability. It's all yours. All right. Oh, yeah, this sound, I can tell this is working. All right. Um, thanks. That was great. Um, what I want to do here is start off with an overview of what I'm going to talk about. I always find that useful in case, is that too loud or? Okay, it just sounds like it's too loud. Um, I want to talk first of all about just, you know, big data is out there. It's, we're going to get a lot of big data available, and it's going to, my point is it's going to be observational. It's not going to be experimental. I'll, make an, I'll explain that in more detail. And really what happens is if you don't account for that observational nature of the data, it's going to lead to serious prediction errors, um, especially if the data are generated by human behavior, which is, I'm a social scientist, and so that's kind of what I want to make sure we bring in human behavior. It's, um, more accurate predictions with observational data are going to require analytical, analytical methods that require, um, um, that, you can, that will let you identify causation. We've got to get to causation here eventually, and we have different analytical methods to do that with observational data. And social sciences have been working on this for a long time. And so my point is that we can contribute something to how to estimate causality, causal relationships with observational data. And what we really need are a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams to develop methods that merge some of these machine learning algorithms that are very good at prediction in big data context with these social science causal inferences, um, getting those two methods together so we can get some accurate predictions. That's the whole talk right there in one slide. Um, so much of science is hypothesis testing. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you are in that sort of world. You're worried, you want to get at causation. How do you do it? You do an experiment. You experimentally vary some treatment. You do replication and randomization. And then you um, estimate the treatment effect. That's sort of the standard experimental approach. Um, social sciences and some of the ecological sciences, some of the epidemiological sciences, they can't do experiments. Um, well, you can, but um, a lot of our data aren't experimental. They're what we call observational. Um, think of, uh, they're often the outcomes of behavioral um, processes is what I'm thinking in the social world. Um, think of what you see a landscape, you see crop choices out there, you see inputs chosen and yields that are generated. Um, fertilizer and corn yields, um, pesticide management practices, things like that. Think of what you see at a landscape of mosaic. You've got measure populations of insects in a field or pathogen intensity measures, and there's going to be control decisions that happen both simultaneously going on at the same time. Obviously, the population is affected by the control decisions, you know, insecticide applications. Insecticide applications are also affected by the pest populations. And you've got observational data, and if you want to make predictions with them, you've got to have appropriate methods, especially if the data are generated by human decisions. That's, that's, that's what the, the, I'm going to say more than once. Um, so I'm going to go through an example here to illustrate the problem. And we're going to back to corn and nitrogen. This one pops up a lot um, in the real world. And this is a common activity. You do experiments, trace out that nitrogen response curve um, for corn yield to nitrogen. So let's say you want to do something different a little bit here. I want to get at the average nitrogen response curve for farmers in a population. So I want to know, you know, in southern Wisconsin, how, what is that response curve going to look like for the whole population so I can make some recommendations to farmers, maybe set some policy saying, you know, 350 pounds is too much. I have data to support that, something like that. Um, that's an exaggeration. Hopefully you're not putting 350 pounds of nitrogen on your corn. Um, so what would you do? You go out and collect survey data. Go out and ask a bunch of farmers, what are you using for nitrogen and what are the yields you're getting? And from that, you want to be able to estimate the nitrogen response curve. And we all know nitrogen causes corn yields to go up. That's sort of a standard thing. Um, the problem is if you go out and do that kind of a data collection, those are observational data. You are not experimentally bearing the nitrogen rate. It's an, it's a, the both are being determined at the same time. These are observational data. So what are farmers up to? This is the story. Um, Suppose a farmer knows his nitrogen response curve is something we call the quadratic response plateau. Nitrogen goes up at a quadratic, or I'm sorry, as you increase the nitrogen rate, the yield goes up quadratically until you get to the peak and then it goes flat. So what's your yield look like? It's some parameter A plus B times nitrogen rate plus C times the nitrogen rate squared up to the peak and then it goes flat. 
what's the farmer going to do? We'll say they're maximizing profit. Um, price of corn times that production relationship minus whatever you're paying for fertilizer, R is the price of fertilizer times the fertilizer rate you put on, so all the other costs of production, K. If you do a little calculus, solve that problem, you're going to get what's the optimal nitrogen rate? It's R divided by P minus your parameter B divided by the 2 times that parameter C. And then you take that N star, plug it in, you get your yield response. So now you know how to, that's your optimal nitrogen rate under this quadratic response plateau. This is essentially what's under the maximum return to end, the Martin um, process that we use to develop recommendations. Uh, the, the whole Midwestern region uses this cor corn nitrogen rate calculator. UW's NPM has a, you can get an app for your smartphone to do it for you. Um, that's essentially what's going on out there. Um, so here's what it looked like. Here's your nitrogen rate here. There's your yield there. It goes up quadratically, hits the peak and goes flat. Um, this is all simulated, made up, but I got A is 70, B is 2, C is point minus, negative, or minus 0.01. You do the math, the max is at 170 at 100 pounds. That's why I picked the nice round numbers to get this. Um, nitrogen price, we'll say is 40 cents. Corn is 350 a bushel. You do the math, do the calculation, you're going to get 94.3 pounds. Yield will be 169.7. That's if you're maximizing returns. That's what's underneath our nitrogen recommendations is this, this curve defined experimentally. Um, so now let's say we're going to go back to our story. We're trying to figure out we want an average one. Instead of this Martin plots in this place, a farmer five miles away going, no, that's not my nitrogen response curve. I got my own farm. It's different than that spot. So, and then you want to develop a policy to sort of restrict or maybe tell recommendations or something like that about nitrogen use. So let's just suppose every farmer is smart. They know their field. They know the nitrogen response function on their farm. They, they know their A, B, and C. They, and we'll see, just to make it simple, everyone's got roughly the same numbers. They're all going to be 72 and point, minus 0.01, but there's a little bit of variation out there in the natural world. So we'll just make some assumptions. Say A is normally distributed with mean of 70 and plus or minus 7 um, is the standard deviation. B is 2, another little deviation. Nitrogen, or I'm sorry, C is normally distributed. The same thing. I just sort of also have a coefficient of variation of 10%. Just a little bit of variation around that. And then we'll say, let's just randomly draw 500 of these from these A, B, and C independently distributed normals, and then do the math, calculate N and Y star. As though the farmers know they're A, B, and C, they get them randomly drawn, and then they optimize. And then we're going to take the data, take that Y star and the N stars, and do this regression. So you can get that average response curve. That's what you want. Well, this is what you're going to get. Here's your nitrogen rate. There's your yield. There's the cloud of farmers right there. Um, remember the 70? Um, 2 and um, minus 0.1, oh, 01. Here's what you're going to get if you do that regression. Complete garbage. It's not at all what we know is the underlying response curve. It's something completely different. Farmers got the same prices. They have, um, they're all maximizing profit. Um, we just drew 500 of these pairs. Do that regression. You get an optimal nitrogen rate of 300 pounds. You yield the 343 bushels. It isn't, this isn't right. We know that's not right. That's because these are observational data. They are generated by a process of human behavior. They are not experimentally controlled. You just can't go and do this. Social scientists took us a long time to figure this out. We did it a long time ago. The reserve nitrogen yield are endogenous. They are co-determined by these profit maximizing choices of the farmers. That's the overall story there. Um, they don't accurately underlie or reveal the underlying causal relationship. We all know nitrogen causes yield to go up, but this isn't how you get at that. Um, so what do you do? Say, so like, oh wow, I want to get this. I want to get that curve. Well, I want to do experiments. We talked. That's a sort of the standard one. There's two big approaches I want to talk about. We can talk about structural approaches, and then these various panel data methods. I'll touch a little bit on those. Um, these are methods that have been around in the social sciences for quite a while. Um, structural model is essentially you build a model at, of the process that's determining these jointly. That's what you do. Um, and then panel data methods. There's something called instrumental variables. I'll talk a little bit about that. And there's some of this stuff in fixed effects and control variables. I'm not a big, I don't do this panel data stuff so much, but I'll talk about it. Um, so let's do the structural model here. This is the story. So back to our story, nitrogen causes corn yields. Um, but where do you get this, what process is jointly determining this? That's where theory comes in. You need to have a theory of what's going on there. And so um, our story we're going to use here is profit maximization. There are other theories out there, utility maximization. We've got some other stories out there. So what do you do? You do that little same thing we just saw, but now you get an N star and you got an R over P in this equation. You just add an error term on the end here. Um, y star is observed yield, and then you got this stuff here, and then you get your N stars again. What you're actually going to end up doing is a linear regression, because if you really look here, 
This is actually the regression variable. You can go out and observe the N star from your population. You, um, there's your R over P, the t prices, that ratio. There's some parameter in front here. There's going to be some parameter here, the intercept term. So you can just really write this as beta times R over P plus alpha. There's your observed N. There's the prices the farmers had. And then you can go out and do the regression. That's, that's all nice and linear. You can get the same thing. You can go through a bunch of work to show that the A, B, and C how you get them. They're, here's what you do your regressions. You can get them from the calculated regressions. Um, that's what you would do. Um, so a lot of people have been doing this. And so it's kind of bizarre um, in the way to think about it. And not a lot of people, I shouldn't say. These are the ones I found. There's another one I found doing this. There's, Bob Chambers is the one that's probably been doing this the earliest that I've run into. He's a professor at the uh, Mar University of Maryland. There's a paper back in 2013 where they actually, the title is Estimating Population Dynamics Without Population Data. It's what you can do with this process is use the, the way farmers respond to prices to, they think and they know what's going on, you can use those responses to actually identify population dynamics without ever measuring population data. You're actually inferring the population dynamics from the farmers' responses to the pests. Um, Seth Wexler, this is a paper in review. I'm a reviewer on it, and this is one of those review processes where they tell you who the author is. Um, pest management science, a structural model, herbicide demand, et cetera. They're doing the same thing in weeds. They're looking at survey data and they're actually estimating how much yield loss from weeds is occurring, how much yield loss would occur if there were no weed control, actually estimating the efficacy of glyphosate and seeing if it declines over time without ever collecting any weed data. All they measure is prices and um, uh, farmer responses to those prices. And assuming farmers are maximizing profit, you got this all figured out. You can get reasonable numbers. It's really surprising. I, it, I was like, wow, this is actually working. There's a review paper. I've just gotten this one back. It's at American Journal of Ag Econ. It's someone. I don't know. This one's a double blind, so I don't know who it is. It's a sense of that same idea, except now they're using farmer choices about rootworm BT corn and able to identify, estimate the, um, how much yield loss is occurring to rootworm BT corn, or I'm sorry, to rootworm, and then how much the efficacy of rootworm BT corn has declined over time due to resistance. Um, I don't know who that is. That's the ones I've been reviewing. This is um, one I've been working on. Um, it's, I, I was really embarrassed to look back, and the file was 2011, was the first I started working on this. I just haven't taken the time to push it through. Um, essentially, we're using seed data. You use seed purchasing data from GFK Clinic. You get several thousand of these observations. You get seeding rates and um, purchase and the prices of everything. You can actually trace out the, the response of, night, of corn yield to seeding rate, um, and then see if it varies by um, using biotech traits or not. So this actually works, and this is out there, where you actually get those, get those production functions, the responses of the yield or whatever to the inputs. Um, that's the, what we call the structure approach. The other way is instrumental variables. And this is, um, you got this going on, and this is this process. You know, we argue about what this process is and stuff like that, so different theories are what really why drives these. Um, but if there's something going on here, you got this problem, is what we call endogeneity here, is um, if you do this regression, y equals alpha plus beta x plus epsilon, or nitrogen and yields, you're going to get correlation between the x and the error term. That's, a, that's because of this endogeneity problem. Something is generating both of these simultaneously. So we have this theory of a way to deal with this is something called instrumental variables. You go out and find a variable x, I'm sorry, z, that determines x that is not correlated with this process down here, whatever this process is. Um, it's like magic. I, I always, as a student, never quite understood this. Where do they get these magical instrumental variables from? <laughs> you use theory to find a variable that causes x that is not correlated with epsilon or the profit maximizing. Um, but so you do is you do this regression. x is equal gamma plus theta times z. Um, and then you take that estimated, or x hat, the, um, yeah, I guess you'd call it the, the estimated x. Plug that and use that as your regression variable. And you've purged x of all these problems that are coming from the profit maximization or whatever that behavior model is. So the big story is then where to get the instruments. Um, that all comes out of um, the theory. What's driving X that doesn't drive, um, that isn't connected to profit maximization. We just did a paper with Terry Hurley at the University of Minnesota on pest management science and it's looking at seed treatments. So here's the question. Do high yields cause farmers to spend money on seed treatments to protect the high yield or do seed treatments cause high yields? That's, that's kind of the question. Which way, which way does that causality go? Um, we have a survey that we're, among other things that you get, it got at soybean yield and whether or not to use a seed treatment. Um, 
we actually did a bunch of, you do a whole bunch of estimations of the test, whether the instruments are needed and how, and et cetera. It's all buried in the appendix. Um, but basically, we able to show that there wasn't an endogeneity problem. But we had, we did a bunch of instrumental variable work looking at using things like tied up with risk, what we thought was risk aversion. That was our Z variable, our instrument. And if you read the literature on this, the, the, word, the instrument is, you're trying to find some, it's theory tells you what it is. That's, and it's so, and it's, if you really read it, there's no, you don't throw a bunch of stuff in looking for the magical instrument. You're not, you're supposed to, um, uh, there's an art to it, I guess, that's the word. And you have to convince your colleagues you have a good instrument. That's, 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 that's how the process is. Like I said, it seems like magic. Um, the next process is like, well, the instrumental variables was first started in the 1920s, and then it really got, took off in the 40s. That's how, that's what, how long this has been around. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, here's fixed effects and control variables. I don't do this one so much. Um, there's a guy, um, Ed Perry, he's now Kansas State. He graduated from Iowa State just a little bit ago. Um, his paper is in Science Advances. Um, really what they're doing is looking at does adoption of Bt corn, Roundup Ready soybeans or corn affect, how does it affect insecticide and herbicide rates, uh, use. Um, and they use this, this is a panel data method. I'm not gonna go through all the details, but what they use are farmer specific fixed effects. Um, they use um, time specific fixed effects for the intercept and the slope. G is your, um, whether that's a one or zero if you use the biotech crop or not. And then there's some region, region specific time trends. Go read the paper, it's got the justification why these eliminate the endogeneity problem. Um, this is, well, I'm picking recent papers so people can go look for this stuff if they want. Um, that's, that's how we deal with this stuff. Um, so we can use observational data to examine some of the same questions that small plot experiments do. Um, it's primical, the empirical results are actually reasonable. You go look and they get numbers that are somewhat similar to what you're getting out of the small plot data, but you're getting a lot larger geographic coverage for a lot lower cost. Imagine doing 400 field plots across the U.S. when you can just, it's much cheaper to go out and survey farmers than it is to do 400 field plots. Um, you need accurate structural models. You know, that Profit function, max, profit maximization, is it utility maximization, what's going on? You gotta have that right, and we spend a lot of time arguing about that with each other, about what's the right model of human behavior. And then you have to have use the writer methods. Um, but this is good news for big data. It means we have methods we can use observational data for production questions. I think another big one we have talking at lunch is human health is another big one. Diet, exercise, and health outcomes, they're all connected, but you, your diet, are you overweight because you don't exercise or you do not exercise because you're overweight? There's a, how do you, they're actually both happening at the same time and you have, to, they're both observational data. You're not experimentally changing people's exercise regimes and seeing the diet, out, or diet outcomes or the um, health outcomes. So um, this is a big topic. It just showed up, the recent issue of Science, that was their special theme, Prediction and its Limits, the January, or February 3rd issue. Machine learning algorithms prediction are hot, and so they have, this is their theme of their special issue. Um, Susan Athey is a um, professor at um, Stanford Business School. Um, her little essay here, there's a quote here from it, but it's essentially the same point I've been making. Using observational data for prediction can lead to major errors. Her, art, her essay is full of examples from the real world. People think they got the figured out, and then you, uh, it's not working, um, because it's just machine learning. You need to focus on causation too. You can't just do prediction with these machine learning algorithms. Social science has been working on this for some time. So here's a quote. Overall, for big data to achieve its full potential in business, science, and policy, multidisciplinary approaches are needed that build on new computational algorithms from, algorithms from the simulated uh, machine learning literature, or I'm sorry, supervised machine learning literature, but that also bring in the methods and practical learning from decades of multidisciplinary research using empirical evidence to inform policy. That's the social science research. That's the point of, the, uh, of the, her article, and she's got some great stuff. When I read this, I said, you know, I'm on the right track. This is making sense. Um, where is agricultural economics going in terms of big data? Um, I see three things happening. Um, methods, development, and improvement. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on developing these empirical methods with solid theoretical foundations and linking machine learning with this causal inference stuff that we've been doing in our profession for a long time, we being the social sciences. Um, there's some farm management stuff. How do we use big data to make management recommendations to improve outcomes on farms? And then some policy questions. Um, what is the effect of, and then pick your favorite, you know, that genetically engineered crops on pesticide use. People have been arguing about that a while. I think they finally answered that question using that GFK kinetic data on you know, thousands of observations. Pick some other ones, Obser you know, rotation effect on yield or tillage on yield. We can finally answer that question broadly using a lot of data. Um, I'm gonna talk about the farm management stuff because that's what I work in more. Okay. 
Ag Funder has a little report out. You can go online. You got to pay to get the report. I'm just taking someone's word for it. They said 1.4 billion was invested in ag big data in 2015 on the private sector. Lots of private efforts to figure out how to make money applying big data to farm management. First time in life, I got called by a headhunter wanting me to come work in the San Francisco area to help work on this. And I was like, oh, I like my job. I don't think I'll do that. Um, CFAIR, the Council for Food, Ag, and Resource Economics, had a webinar series. Keith Colbert was a speaker. He's a production economist. He's a chair of Mississippi State. He's on the committee. He's been working in this area. His favorite thing, it made me laugh when I read it, farm management has become sexy. That's how he said it. And I was just like, wow. Um, you can go watch the video if you want. Um, farm management is not sexy, I'll be honest. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the least sexy part of ag econ sometimes, I think. Um, but here's something I think that really actually is right on here. And this has really made me understand what I want to work on um, over the next several years. And I've got um, a sabbatical coming up. Um, it, what will the ag economist look like that works on this? Going to work in multidisciplinary teams can distinguish causation from correlation. We've been talking about that. And then train to use machine learning to work with the geospatial and less structured data and to know how to clean data. You have to have some of these, I call them computer science skills, and then stick in the rest of stuff that we actually already do. Um, some possible examples here. Um, I've been working at UG Saikai as a graduate student here in AAE. Matt Ruark has been pointed to a couple times. He's in soil science. Rebecca Willett, I don't know if she's here. She was spoke earlier. Um, Matt's in charge of the Discovery Farms, and he's got tons of data from a bunch of these farmers cooperating in this um, network, I guess we'll call it. Edge of field runoff for many fields over many years, sediment, nutrient losses in the water. You got it by day, you got it by event, by month, by season, by year. You got a lot of the cropping history, the methods, the, all the, what the farmer's been doing, and method timing and rate of fertilizer, manure, tillage, et cetera. You got the weather data, you got the soil parameters. And now you can finally start teasing out with observational data, what are the relative contributions of farmer management, weather, and soil factors for soil erosion, nutrient loss, and yield? We just started talking about this. We had our first meeting this week or last week, um, and I have met Rebecca for the first time today, um, just briefly. So this is all in the talk phase. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, this is my talk. Yeah, this is great. Okay, this is the end. Um, a lot of big data are observational, a lot of experimental. Not accounting for the observational data of these, nature of these data can lead to serious prediction errors. Go read the Susan Athey article in Science. That's a good example of um, places, of, of documented examples. Especially if the data are generated by human behavior. Making more accurate predictions of observational data requires analytical methods that identify causation. Social scientists have been working on this for decades. Um, we have several such methods. I talked about structural models, panel data methods. There's other stuff I haven't talked about. But we really need a multidisciplinary team to develop methods, new ways of merging machine learning that are really good at prediction with these social science methods to get more accurate prediction. And the, my last point is, my own experience is it's very hard for non-economists to kind of get into our world. It's often better if economists come out and learn the sciences. This has been my impression and my own experience. And I had a professor tell me that when I was a grad student. Um, that that's been, he was, he was a biologist, a uh, botanist, and that's what he said. I can't understand what you guys are doing. You have to come over and figure out our science. Um, so I think what it's going to take some economists to go out and learn this machine learning algorithms. That's what I think it's going to take. All right, thanks for your attention. I got off the hook. Right, right. So, the, right. The, the, the question is, is where do you get that structural model from? That you have to have a field, a theory that people in your field have to have worked on that for a while. These, you don't just, the first time, the first person who ever brought up the idea of profit maximization is driving all the behavior, they had this, that wasn't accepted immediately. You have to go through a lot of work to show that. And that's where your domain knowledge, your field knowledge, being active in your profession as a group, the profession has to realize that's a good behavior model. And people spend a lot of time testing these models out through experiments, doing other kinds of studies to see which model is most consistent with people's decisions and things like that. So you rely on your profession, whatever that profession is. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just wondering about the expert system or knowledge engineering approach as opposed to some of the big data uh, approaches. Are, are people in your, your uh, teams also experienced?
exploring expert system or knowledge shot uh, engineering? Uh, I'm unaware of any. I, I don't know, but I, I haven't looked for that. It's, it's an older approach, but it's sometimes it Well, I didn't want to say that, but yeah, that's what it seemed like. It's, uh, it's, I remember seeing stuff in the 80s on that, and I never quite understood what expert systems meant, but that was sort of, I remember people writing about that and talking about it but I haven't seen anything recently. But I'm not looking for it either. Let's thank Dr. All right, thanks.